after this service. And remember, we need all your cooperation for December 24th that we're going to have this special service on Christmas Eve here in our church, the Men's Sanctuary, Saturday at 7 p.m. Now, we continue in our study of the Sermon of the Mount, and now we come to this second part of this chapter 7, and I title this message today, Keep on Prayer. Keep on Prayer. Um, as I said the last week, uh, lights please, can we turn off this light? As I said the last week, the... Chapter 7 of Matthew is actually the summary of the whole Sermon on the Mountain. The first 1 to 5 and 6 actually talks about the character of Christians. As we are here not to judge the war, but to have discernment about what's going in the world. There's one judge who will judge everyone and who will judge the living and the dead when he comes again. That's the Lord Jesus. We are not to judge each other, but to have discernment, to have some kind of judgment of what is good and what is evil. God give us this knowledge, wisdom, to discern what is good and what is evil. And if something is good and praiseworthy, then we have to think about such things. But if something is evil or will not glorify God, we need discernment. Because maybe in the eyes of many people, things are good, but in the eyes of God, instead of giving the glory, it's just taking away the glory that he deserves to receive and give it to the world or giving to people instead of giving to God. God is the one who ultimate receives all the glory, all the power, and all the praise forever. And this second part of this chapter 7 is about, once again, to focus on prayer. Jesus told us in chapter 6 how to pray. And we studied this series about the Lord's Prayer. And he said, when you pray, you pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For you is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So Jesus told us how to pray. He told us to pray for our needs. He told us to pray also for forgiveness and to give the glory and the praise to God because that's His will on earth as He planted in heaven. So now we know His will. We know that God, He teaches us to pray and He wants us to pray. And as I said in this series, this Lord prayer is a, is a prayer for His entire body, for His entire church, for the universal church. It's not just an individual prayer. It's a prayer in community. And, 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 and Jesus told us to, when we pray, we don't say, my Father who is in heaven, but he said, our Father who is in heaven. So it's a, it's a, 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 a simple, it's a, a, a design for a co prayer in communion. When we have prayer meetings, we should keep this order or we should put in our prayers these parts of the the teaching of the Lord. But then, the Lord, now, again, in chapter 7, He talked about prayer, and He gave us three words to put a frame in our prayer. To draw a frame in our prayers, request, He say, ask, seek, and not. And that's why we're going to Started today in this uh, time of the year that is necessary to focus on prayer more and to keep praying, keep on praying. Because if we give up now, that we see that, okay, it's the, the end of the year and everything that I asked God so far didn't work, 
or he didn't grant it to me, and you just give up just before these three weeks or two more weeks that we have ahead at the end of the year, then you're probably going to miss something in your life. And you have to wait for another year to receive your miracle, to receive the answer of your prayer. It's a funny story that one person shared, and he said that there were a child who was asking for his parents for a brother. He was a lonely child at home. And say, Dad, I want to have a baby. I want to have a, 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 bro a baby brother. I want to have a brother. I want to I wanna have brothers and sisters in, my, in, in our family. Dad, give me a brother. And then this father of this home talk and look at his wife and they look at each other and then the father say to the boy, okay, if you want a brother, why don't you start to pray to God for a brother? And then these brothers start to pray according to his father's suggestion. And he said, dear God, I want to have a brother. Please send a brother to our family and to my life. And this boy start to pray for one week. And as he see that nothing happened, so he continue. And he prayed for one month. Then after one month, nothing happened. Then he continued to pray the second month. And then in the second month, nothing happened. Then he decided to pray for another month. And in the third month, nothing happened again. So he gave up in prayer. And he is told to pray to God for a brother. Then, six months later, his parents sent him to his grandparents' house. And after a week, he returned home. And when he get into the house, he was there greeting his mother and his father. And then the father said, okay, now we have a surprise for you. Then from a room inside the house, the father brought a baby and show into this little boy and say, this is your little brother that you asked to God. The boy was surprised to see the baby. But the father said, wait. And then he went back to the room and he brought another baby. And the boy was with his eyes very open seeing the two babies. And the father said, wait. And he went into the room again and he brought another third baby. And now the father said to the boy, aren't you glad that now you have not just one brother, baby brother, but you have now three brothers? And then the boy looked at the father and say, and aren't you glad that I stopped to pray in three months? Okay, three months, three babies. That's not funny. <laughs> but yes. Sometimes we are like this boy. That we pray and we see nothing happen. Pray it again and we see that nothing happened. And pray it again and we see that nothing happened. And then we start to pray because we think, oh, maybe this is not God's will. Or maybe this is not a pray that God wants us to pray. The Bible encourages us to pray all the time. And God wants us to pray all the time. Actually, it's Paul that says, pray in all circumstances, without ceasing. And, and, and James said, yes, you don't have because you don't ask. Ask, and God will grant you your request. Paul said to the Philippians, all your souls, all your, your petitions, all your hearts, present your request to God with thanksgiving. And God who knows your heart and, and, and knows your souls and is full of all understanding, he will answer your request. So we see that the Bible encourages to pray, but are we keeping praying? Or are we keeping our prayer request to God as we should? Why we should keep praying? That's the question. And I want to give you these answers. Why we should pray? And we're going to study why we don't pray or we don't keep in, in praying as we should. And we should keep praying because first, God has the power 
to answer our prayers. Now, do you believe that God, that God has all power? Do you believe that God is almighty or powerful? Then, if you know that God has no limits, and if you ask according to his will, he has all the power to make this request become true or to have the answer of this request, right? So, if we know that God has all power to answer the, pray the prayers that we ask him in his name according to his will, let me ask you this question. For God to release his power, do we have to pray? For God to exercise his power because he's almighty, did he need our prayers? Don't answer me. Don't say yes or no. Just think about it. But let me ask you one more question. Do we bother God enough for let him release that power that we know that he have and as we ask for his power or his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven? Why we keep praying? Why we pray in Jesus' name? Why we have to pray or why we should pray continuously? This Questions are the, the answers of this very question that we say while we keep praying. Because God is so powerful, we should and we must keep praying. Because God also, He released His power when we pray in His name and according to His will, we should keep praying. And because we have some kind of relationship with God that we, by God's power, we can limit it, His power, or we can limit it, His will, depends on what we pray or how we pray or how much we persevere in prayer. God is unlimited and He's almighty and He's all-powerful and His will is supreme. But, he gave us the privilege to add and condition His will through our prayers. But people have misunderstanding in praying to God as we bothering God in prayer. And that's why people don't pray because they say, oh, maybe we should bother God. And this is the, 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 the picture that we have from that teaching from Jesus. As remember, Jesus was teaching in, in Luke chapter 18 about the unjust judge. And, it's in, in, and we have to relate this, this, this uh, illustration because Jesus said before in, in the previous verses, do not judge. But then he talked about prayer and he gave an illustration of prayer and said, Oh, we should keep praying. We should keep knocking and asking because, yes, let me illustrate like this. There were a woman who presented her, her request to an unjust judge or unjust king. And this judge, he didn't fear God or didn't fear men, but because this woman was bothering him day and night, he finally, he got mad and crazy about her and he granted her request. Now, many Christians think, okay, so we have to pray like this woman to an unjudged judge. But the truth is that our God is not unjudged. Our God is judge and righteous. We have to interpret this parable or this illustration under the principle of prayer. The principle of prayer is Keep on prayer. Keep on praying. That's the principle. The illustration that doesn't affect the principle. Doesn't change the principle. But many Christians misunderstand that God is unjudged. God, in some ways, because to one person, he answered the prayer. But to another person, he doesn't answer the prayer. Those two persons are good Christians. 
They go to church, they offerings, tithes, and serve in church. And they are good in character. But one person received the answer of his prayer and the other person didn't receive the answer of his prayer. And what is the condition of that? And people think that God is unjudged sometimes. Or he, he has favoritism. He discriminates people or prayers. And people, some people bothering God enough to receive his prayer. And some people, they don't think that they should bother God in prayers. And that's why they misinterpreted this, this parable in this way. But we have no be confused or make the mistake to misinterpret this parable of, of this teaching of Jesus, but just pick up the principle that we, according to the all Bible and other scriptures, we must keep on prayer, prayer without ceasing, and praying continuously. Jesus said in chapter 6 about what we pray that, yes, when we pray, we don't use repetitions. And we are not praying like other people that they are just babbling. Or like the Pharisees that they just want to show up. They are praying and fasting. Jesus said, remember when you pray, your father knows the things that you, have to, that you need before you ask. Now, if Jesus said that if our Father knows everything before we ask, then the question is, why we have to ask? In other words, if God knows our prayer request, why we have to pray? If God knows everything, then why, why we have to bother Him with our prayers? So once again, these questions. Are we required to pray our saint, a certain amount of prayer so that God can do something? Do we have to keep praying and praying and praying and, and, and sometimes this becomes cultural. The way that we pray in one nation, in another nation, in one church, in another church, in one congregation, in another congregation, in one denomination, in another denomination, is barrier these days. Excuse me. And some people say, well, we should even shout to God and I'm not talking against this Korean culture of prayer because I myself, even I'm not Korean, I love to, to pray to God and claim to God. Like many Korean people, they say, Chia! And some American friends say to me, is God death? <laughs> he cannot hear prayers in, in silence. But it's, it's, it's not that God is death. Or, 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 or God is answer only to Korean people. But yes, in Latin America, from when I'm from, from Peru, people say, if you are praying in an international conference and there is a Korean person praying next to you, you don't need to pray together. Just let the Korean people pray for you. <laughs> because God will listen to them more than you because they always say, Chia! And they just and they just run in their prayer. So why bother God with your prayers if your brother is enough claiming, claiming to God? Well, it's not about making noise, okay? Once again, I love, and many times when I pray to Korean people, I say with all my strength three times, Lord, 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 in Korean language. Chiyo, chiyo, chiyo. So I love to do that. Not because it's a culture of prayer. But because I know this principle from Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 3, that says, Claim to me. Claim to me, and I will answer you, and I will show you wonderful things that you don't know. So this principle, as my style of prayer, then I claim to the Lord in any language, Spanish, Korean, or English, Japanese, or whatever. When I was in Indonesia, I, I, I prayed with Indonesian people in, in Indonesian language. Tuha member God, God bless me. When I was in Japan, I didn't, I wasn't Christian, but yes, I prayed with 
Spanish people there. Here in Korea, I prayed with Korean people. Chia! And with you, I prayed in English. In a moderate way. <laughs> but it's not just following a culture. It's not just following a style of prayer. It's praying with the heart. And praying with the principle of be consistent and asking God for his will be done in your life, in our community, in this world, as it is in heaven. And pray continuously, continuously, until we see God's will be done. And we pray and standing out at the edge of God's will. So we can see God's judgment come into this world. Come into our life. Come into other people. Once again, why we keep praying. So let me give you some kind of <clears throat> help to understand this question. Why we keep pray praying? Because first, God has deposited his power in us. Remember what Jesus said to his disciples. Stay here in Jerusalem until you receive the power from above. And you will be my witness in, all Judea, in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. So we have now God's power to pray. And we have this power from God. I mean, God has all the power, as we just said, to answer our prayers. But he entrusted this power to us to pray for the nations, to pray for others. To pray for our own needs. So this is the second reason. We, we must release God's power that he deposited in us through prayer. So if we have the power of prayer. If we have the power from God to pray. This unlimited power that comes from the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit helping us to pray with with sounds, with growings that we cannot understand or repeat, then why we stop praying? Why we don't pray? And why we don't release this power to pray? And the third reason is because God adds His fire or His power in our prayers. And this is the same fire, the same power that came in Pentecost Day when the people were together in the, in the, in the upper room praying for 40 days. For 50 days that the Lord will come and send the Holy Spirit. And this is the same power of prayer that Elijah prayed when he restored the altar of the Lord. And made his sacrifice in front on this priest of Baal. And it's the same fire that came to help the people of Israel to, to guide him and answer the, the prayer of Moses in the desert. As they going through the way to the promised land. When we understand this. When we understand these reasons that we have the power of God. He lent us his power. He gave us his power. He, he, um, he poured his spirit. And this spirit with fire in our hearts. Burning in us to pray continuously. To pray for his will be done. With this anxious and with this request in front of God, we know that His will is in us already. And He'd lead us to pray continuously. And He'd lead us to keep on praying. What would be our prayer request? As we know that Jesus, in this Sermon of the Mountains, He led us and teach us to focus in one thing. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. So God wants us to access to his power, to be empowered from him, to pray for his kingdom and for his righteousness. If we ask, let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, then we are seeking we are searching for this kingdom to be established in this world. We are looking for that day that the whole world will bow their knees to the Lord and confess with their mouth that Jesus is the Lord until he makes all these things new again. 
But until we wait on his second coming, yes, he promised us that he, give, he will give us everything that we need. Of course, according to his will. And according to the benefits and the blessings for our life. But we have another principle to remember when we keep in, we keep in our prayers. And Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20 said that now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Paul was saying that we should pray and pray for brothers and pray after persecution, pray in, after times of need or pray for healing because God he not just exercised his power in us, like you say, his power war in us and war in our prayers, and according to this power that war in our prayers, war in us, then we ask or we think. But the Holy Spirit didn't guide the Apostle Paul to just let us remember that we have the power that wars in our prayer, but there's a power that comes and is able to us abundantly. And it's a power that is exceedingly abundantly. And it's able to do in us exceedingly and abundantly to all who pray. And how we pray? We pray in Jesus' name. We pray as Jesus teaches us how to pray. But also we pray with Jesus. And, and, and it's interesting that the book of Ephesians teaches us how to pray in many ways. And in chapter 1, it says that, yeah, we have the name of Jesus, na name about all names, about principalities, about everything created. And we learn from chapter 2 of Ephesians that we are seated with Jesus in the heavenly reigns. We are seated with Jesus at the right hand of God and we are praying with Jesus. We are interceding with Jesus. So if we know that we have this power work in us, we are sitting with Jesus in, and praying with Jesus and we pray in his name, then what is limiting our prayers? And why we don't have the answers of our prayers sometimes. One thing is that we stop to pray or we don't keep praying. And why we don't keep praying? Because sometimes we just think about complacencies. We think that, well, I think I pray enough or maybe God doesn't want me to pray this thing or I'm praying in the wrong way and then we just start to argue in our mind and saying maybe I shouldn't pray about that and we just have a complex sense of okay we did our best this is not God's will so I stopped to pray another reason is that because we have <coughs> lack of belief or as Jesus say you little faith you have little faith and our, it's our, our unbelief that is stop us to pray and say, well, mm, maybe God is not able to answer this prayer. And it's interesting that sometimes when we pray about disease, we give up easily. When we just see the report on a doctor for a terminal ill, and we have no more hope that we're going to be cured and we just stop praying God is not that powerful I don't have enough faith to believe in God or I have no faith to pray to God and then we stop praying the third one is discouragement and this is coming no from us but come from the devil the devil wants us not to, not to pray anymore. 
he doesn't want us to continue in prayer. He wants us to stop praying. And he tried to discourage all the time using these arguments that will, that's supposed to help us to pray, but the devil is using these arguments or these attributes of God or these characteristics of God to stop us to pray. It's the same estrategy that the devil used in the Garden of Eden for Adam and Eve. He just distorted the truth. When Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, God said, do not eat from this tree, for in the moment that you eat from this tree, you're going to die. And the devil just came and just paraphrased what God said and say, and, 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 and come with a rhetorical question to Eve and say, did really God say that? And made the woman think and, and make her confused about the truth of God. And God is sovereign, that it means that he's supreme, he's the first of everything, and he's immutable, he doesn't change. He doesn't change in his character, he doesn't change in his nature. But these two facts of God shouldn't stop us to pray, but shouldn't help us to pray more or continue to pray. But the devil is using this that say, okay, it is probably not God's will, but your will that is in this prayer. And God is sovereign, so his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Then, and if your petition is not God's will, then why you pray? You should stop praying because it's not God's will. And the devil is working in our mind and, and saying, and we start to think, oh yeah, maybe this is not God's will. Maybe I'm not praying according to God's will and according to James. Yeah, well, I won't have this prayer because it's a wrong prayer. Or the devil say, well, God doesn't change in his character. And that's why, why you try to break God's will with your prayer. Why you try to, to bother God. With your prayers. God won't change. So don't bother God with your prayers. Because God won't re will answer your prayers. And you're just bothering him. And then we just start to think, yeah, maybe I'm bothering God. Instead of praying to God. What is prayer? Prayer is a conversation with God. You pray to God like you talk to your father, to your brother, to your teacher. So it's a conversation. The problem is the devil tried to think of that prayer is just a religious act or performance. And we come to pray like, okay, we have to pray in this way, in a ritual form, in, a, in this way, on that way. And then we make our prayer that's supposed to be uh, intimacy with God, a, a confidence of our relationship, assurance of our relationship with God, a ritual, a ceremony. And then we just give up because we think well, probably we are not clean enough, we are not good enough to continue with this ritual, and we are not doing in, uh, in God's will, and that's why God doesn't answer our prayers. We have the power to pray. And God wants us to release this power of prayer. And he wants us to continue praying and exercise this power to change things. But it's our limitation of knowing God that stops us to pray. If we know that God is sovereign, yes, we should pray because it is His will and my prayer is not my will. It's His will. And if the Bible said that we should pray for these things and, we should, and the Bible asks us to pray for His kingdom come and for His will be done on earth and what is God's will is to make people be safe. And we pray for those who are not Christians. We pray for those who are sick because the Bible says pray for those who are sick, call the elders. So we are praying for those who are sick. We are praying for those who need to receive Jesus' salvation. We pray for kids. We pray for family. We pray for ourselves. 
and with all petitions and requests we come to God with humble heart and with thanksgiving and we pray God and God who knows our hearts and our thoughts he grants us the answer of our prayer because he is a loving father and Jesus asked and teach us to ask to God, give us today our daily bread and forgive our sins. And let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So if we ask God to lead us not into temptation, to feed us every day, to protect us, to forgive our mistake, then why we doubt about his will, his power be done in our life. And since God never changed, we have also the reason to keep praying because God says that his mercy endures forever. So God is merciful and he will be always merciful. That's something that never changes in God's character. So if we ask God for mercy, for favor, for blessing, God in his character, he will keep his promise. His promise are always yes and amen. So therefore, we keep praying because we know that God is immutable. He won't change and his promise will be always yes and amen. So instead to stop praying, we keep praying. And we keep praying because we know that God will definitely will be judged. But also we will be a loving God forever. God is love and his righteous and we seek God's kingdom and his righteousness then let that help us and guide us and teach us to keep on praying when we pray we know that we pray for the nations and we pray for other people too these days Korea need to pray more America need to pray more the entire world needs to pray more and keep on prayer more and more and more. Instead to give up in prayer because we just see the news and this news just discourages us, we must pray more. We must keep praying. In the Bible we have examples of people who understand this principle that God is sovereign and He is immutable. And they, even though they keep praying to God. Let me tell you the example of Jonah. Jonah was called to God to go to Nineveh and declare God's judgment. And he said, God will punish this city, destroy this city, if you don't repent. And actually, Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh because he knew God is sovereign and he knew that God is immortal. And Jonah, Jonah, he went, not Jonah, Jonah is here, but Jonah, he, he went to Nineveh by force and he's after he asked to the people of Nineveh to come back to God they actually did they repent repent and in thus and with and, and, and in humbleness they turned back to God even though they didn't know God and no and, and Jonah was angry that God forgive this nation. He, as an Israelite, he want to see God as a judge, a righteous judge, to punish this country for their sins. And he was probably looking for a revenge. God would be for Jonah, his avenger. But instead that God exercised his power, unlimited power, through this evangelist campaign, the whole nation turned back to God. And God's for, God's forgiveness and mercy and love was exercising truth. This faith that Jonah have in going and evangelize the people of Nineveh. Now, God has a plan to judge this country. But God changed his mind. He didn't change his character. God is always saying yesterday, today, and, for, and forever. But he changed his mind. In other words, he 
relent. And this word relent is related with the word repent. To do what he planned to do. And God changed his mind because the, the translation of the word repent is meaning not to confess that you did wrong, but it means to change your mind. So God changed his mind to punish Nineveh, and because he saw that they humbled themselves, then he extended his mercy for another period. We know that after years later, God punished Nineveh. But in that time, God changed his mind. He postpones his judgment for later because he saw people who repented and who prayed God for forgiveness. And this prayer of these people who never know God now changed God's mind. Now, what happened with Moses? Moses was in the Mount of Sinai. And he saw that the people of Israel, they sing against God. They created an idol. And God said, I'm going to make a new nation from your family, and I'm going to wa wash away this generation from your eyes. I'm going to create a new nation from you. But Moses said, Lord, don't do that. What are the people of this nation going to say about this? That you brought these people in the desert to kill them? Remember your promise to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob. Don't make a, a new nation from Moses. And the people say, oh, this is the nation of Moses. And the, and the father of faith will be Moses. But let your promise to Abraham, the father of faith, the father of nations, be the same forever. And God relented. He repented for what he planned to do to the people of Israel because Moses' prayer. Because Moses' prayer. And Abraham... When he saw that God decided to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham said to God, Lord, let's, let's, let's reason for, for a moment. Imagine, a man tried to make God be reasonable. And, and, and Abraham had the boldness to say, because he, considered, he was considered as a friend of God. So talking to friend to friend, okay, let's say, Okay, why don't we talk for a minute? Before you just, just do your judge, before you move a finger, why don't we just think for a minute? Just think for a minute. What about if there are like 100 just people there? 100 righteous. But the guy say, well, you have 100. I won't destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And then Abraham continued, what about there's no 100 or, or 50? And he started to, to discount. And, and, and even Abraham was considered a friend of God. He had fear. He was a solemn fear and say, okay, just let me talk one more time. I know I'm bothering you. I'm bothering you, but just one more, one more. What about is there five righteous there? Would you forgive this city or ten? Maybe ten? And God said, if there's only ten, yes. I will not destroy the city. But it was Abraham persistent, consistent in, in, in keeping on praying, that stopped and limited God's power to forgive this city. What happened if Abraham said, and Lord, what about if there's only just one righteous? Just only one. Would you forgive this city? But Abraham didn't pray that. He just stopped in 10. Just stopped in 10. God's will is for us to exercise the power that he released in us. And this is the power of prayer. The power of intercession. And we can pray for the nation. We can pray for this country. We can pray for, for this church, for our families. We can pray for our children. We can pray for us. And as we pray, we are not just exercising the power to let God change his mind, but exercising the power that God changed us. In the process, we are the ones who are changing. Actually, that's what Lewis says. I pray because 
The need flows out of me all the time, waking and sleeping, and it doesn't change God. It changed me. I pray because, and I keep on praying because it, this changed me. And as much as I pray to God, my relationship with God is deepened. I understand more about God's attributes, God's will, and it changed my life. And I agree with Lewis because that's what I experienced 20 years in my life here in, in Christianity in Korea. So Jesus said to us, ask, seek, and know because if you ask, it will be given to you. If you seek, you will find. And if you know, the door will be open. So we keep praying because we have the promise of Jesus to ask, to seek, and to knock heaven's door. Charles Stanley would say, God is honored by large, difficult, and impossible requests when we ask, we seek, we know and trust our loving Father always to answer for our good. So if we know that when we keep on praying, we are honoring God while we stop praying. So what should we ask for? What should we seek for? What should knock? Jesus said once again that we are here to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So ask and it will be given to you. Ask and you will have. The Bible said about that. And what we ask actually, we need to interpret this at, at the light of the Gospels together. And look, it's the Gospel that is more similar than other gospel to Matthew. And Luke retelling the same story in his own way, in his own version, he after he he recorded that Jesus said, Ask, seek, and not, he added, If you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. So what do we have to ask for? We have to ask for more power. More power of what? More power of prayer. When you pray, you, you need more power. Power to believe for your unbelief. Power to, to strain your prayer time, to keep praying, to fight against the devil. So you ask for the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit power so you can be witness of your prayers to the end of the earth. So we ask and God will grant you this petition because this is God's will that you will receive power to be his witness. That's something that we don't see in Matthew, but yes, Luke help us to know that yes, if we ask, even though we are evil, and as evil parents, we can give to our children what they need. We don't give in a serpent, we don't give in a sword, but God knows what we need, and he knows that we need a spirit, his spirit. So we ask for his spirit. We ask for the Holy Spirit. Then what we seek? We seek his face. We seek his presence. And actually in this Christmas season, we, we are seeking for seeing Jesus again in our lives. Look for Christ, says Le Lewis in Christmas story. And you will find him. And with him, everything else. In other words, seek first the kingdom of God and you will have everything else. So seek his face. As these three Maggie, they, went, they came from the Orient to Netherlands to see the baby Jesus, to meet him personally. So in your prayer, try to seek God's face. Try to see Jesus praying with you, seeing yourself sitting in the right hand of God, praying for the nations. Seeing yourself, picture yourself. Seek his face in your prayer. And no, just knock the heaven's door, but knock the heart of God. Knock the heart of God. The value of persistent prayer is not that he will hear us, but we will hear finally God. When you pray, just put your ear in God's 
heart. Let your ear hear his heart beating. If you can listen to God's heart, you will continue praying. You will keep on praying. You will let that his prayer will be yours and you will ask according to his will. In the first century, St. John Sinamos, he said like this, Ask with tear, seek with obedience, knock with patience. For thus he who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. So how is to ask? Probably with tears. Of course, seek with obedience and knock with patience until God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for calling us again.